most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In this episode, we are going to have a conversation with Alexis T. Jones. She is the founder and CEO of Adaptive Accent LLC. Hi Alexis, uh, you have been doing some great work and I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. You know, treating speech disorders and improving communication skills for many people, that is interesting. And uh, as you can see, I also have an accent. So this is a very interesting conversation with for me. <laughs> and also, it is an interesting field and requires special skills, I will imagine, and dedication to impact uh, people's lives in, in a unique manner. You know, telling someone that uh, I can help you still keep your accent, but use it in a better way. Sometimes it can be a little bit aggravated for people. So I can imagine how much work that put into your shoulder. So anyway, I am all ears to know about your venture uh, with your company and your wonderful journey so far. So speech language therapy is, um, as I said before, is interesting and unique feel. So how did the idea of getting into it come to you? Well, accent modification is something that I've always had a passion about due to my culture and my heritage, my upbringing. My mother is from the Gullah Coast of South Carolina. And so she's always had the ability to kind of switch it up. Like when we go to the island of Defusky or Defusky Island, that's where she was born and from the area of Bluffton, South Carolina. So that area is what we call Gullah. And so that has always been an interest of mine because when I go back, I hear this different language, I hear this different tongue. But then when we go back home, she's able to kind of switch it back. And so I always wondered about that. Was that something that people learn or is it innate? Or you know, how does it actually happen in the brain? And then furthermore, in terms of speech language pathology, that has been a passion of mine since I was in uh, college. I actually changed my major between my sophomore year and my junior year. I actually took a speech class over the summer and I really, really enjoyed it. And so my father suggested, well, if you like speech so much and language, then why don't you, you know, kind of look up speech language pathology? And so I did that. And then I also shadowed some speech language pathologist at the hospital that my father worked at. And I just felt like, okay, this could be something interesting because it's such a broad scope of practice. You can specialize in one thing or you can kind of generalize in a few. It's so many different types of um, specialties you can actually look into within speech language pathology. Wow. This is interesting. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, I still, I'm still wondering how your mom handled both of them, though, you know, from switching between each. Yeah. Those, she, I will think she will get confused at some point, right? Well, I used to think so, but it's something that I, I feel just in terms of experiencing it, that it just kind of naturally happens once she's back in the flow with her, her, you know, her family that still lives there. And what's also interesting is that her sister, uh, has always kept her accent, but she moved the furthest away from Defusky Island, from the south, the south coast. But she has kept her accent; it has never changed. So I've always just found that very, very interesting. And so from there, once I entered my master's program at the University of Memphis, I had a clinical practicum where we actually worked with a whole range of folks that had accents. And so that is actually where we started to learn how to produce the different sounds that people who spoke English as a second language actually wanted to learn. And so within that, you kind of start to notice that the International Phonetic Alphabet has, I mean, it's huge. It's a huge range of 
how sounds are produced. And then furthermore, how sounds are produced in the English language, that is what these students were looking to find. So it's not so much, hey, you've got an accent, let me help you, because everyone has an accent. No one needs help. Accents are just different. They are not deficient in any way. The only time that you may feel sometimes if your accent may be deficient is because there may be a communication barrier. So there are different ways to, you know, around that in order for you to be better understood, but still not necessarily lose your accent because your accent is a part of who you are. It's what makes everybody unique. So that's a lot of, you know, (laughs) what I'm very much interested in and why I do what I do. I love it. So adaptive (laughs) accent, am I saying the name correctly? Yes, adaptive accents. Mm-hmm. You know what I like about it? The name speaks for itself. <laughs> Not only it just say it speaks for itself. <laughs> but um, yes. I, I would like you to shed more light on how it come into being and how it's been helping people adapt mm-hmm. to different accents. Yes. So uh, the way that it can help people is really, it's kind of what I like to call subjective. And it's really contingent upon the client and what they want. I start out all of my sessions, all of my workshops, asking clients, what is it that they want from the services that I provide? Not me telling them what they should do or shouldn't do in order to get here or there. It's more about what is it that you are looking for in terms of your definition of communicative success? So for example, I believe it's been a while now, I just finished a workshop, a 12 week workshop with a group Uh, I believe half of them were in China and then some of them were in Russia. And this was before the war started, unfortunately. But what they were, what they were looking for was the ability to speak English the way that they hear it spoken within their organization, because they work with so many people who have English as their first language. So in other words, it's not about, oh, I want to sound like them or I want to be like someone else. It's more about in order for me to get my job done and get it done in an efficient manner, this is what I've I've sought out in terms of my leadership, in terms of personal and professional development. And so what my job where my job comes in is I ask them a lot of questions about, okay, how long have you been speaking English? What do you feel is a challenge for you? What do you do? What do you feel you do well? How do you think learning the sounds of the English language is going to help you further along in your career? And so I had them answer a lot of personal questions, kind of really diving deep internally. And from there, I say, remember, this is what you said you wanted. And so I'm going to help you get there. And so what I do is I really, really focus on objective, measurable growth. It's not about, oh, you sound so good now. What does that really mean? Oh, you sound better now. What does that really mean? You know, so in other words, what we do is we take a look at this is how you sounded before we started the program. And this is how you sound afterward. So now we have some real change that we can actually measure. And I ask the client afterwards, I say, is this something more, you know, a, more in line with what it is that you were wanting before we started out? And if the answer is yes, then from there, I say, well, this is going to be your maintenance program in terms of you maintaining what you've learned. But always remember what we talked about from the very beginning. You must keep what is true to you. And that's the definition, again, of adapting, being able to internalize the things that you learn, extrapolate and go further. So it's not really about I've got to continue up and up and up. And then whatever I was before, I'm just going to leave that behind. No, adaptation includes a whole lot of growth. And so that's why I like to stress to my clients that it's really it's really all about you. It's not about I have a cookie cutter type of regimen and I teach that to every single person that comes through. It's more about 
personalization and customization. Wow. So before you started uh, your company, did you work for uh, other companies before you decided that, hey, I'm going to start my own journey? No, actually, I created Adaptive Accents back in 2012. When I came wow. out of the University of Memphis for my graduate work, I went ahead and got certified in uh, at, at accent modification. And so from there, I just always had, you know, in kind of in the background, my own company doing what I wanted to do. However, there were other ventures that I took on in terms of growing just as a speech language pathologist, because what a lot of people don't realize is that speech language pathology is what we are taught as speech language pathologists. And most of what we cover or most of the clientele that we, we uh, treat are in a disordered population. Hmm. Accent modification is not in any way disordered population unless there is something else that is along with the accent. Accents in themselves are not disordered. However, speech language pathologists have the knowledge base from their undergraduate work through their graduate work to work on accents or to modify them. Because when we are in school, we go over the international phonetic alphabet we learn articulation, we learn the placement of sounds, we learn how to produce sounds and therefore how to teach them. And we use that knowledge and we place it in the same type of work. But again, this is more difference, not disorder. Do you think that people mix the, the two? Yes, <laughs> all the time. And that is why accent modification is... Um, for lack of a better term, controversial. Uh, when I graduated, I remember my professors telling me, you know, because I was like, I love accent modification. I think this is so interesting. And they would, you know, not so much warn, but they would just let me know, well, you're, you're a student, but once you come out and you start practicing as a clinician, you'll start to see that accent modification may not be looked upon the same way that speech language pathologists do. From my experience, most people, I would say lay people who don't really understand what an accent truly is, if they hear one, they may judge it and say, oh, well, that sounds like this person is, and then fill in the blank. Or, oh, you sound like you're from. You know, so again, really trying to work from an objective standpoint typically wards off the negative. Um, the negative judgment. And when I have clients that come through, you know, I also explain that to them because sometimes I do have clients coming to me saying, oh, I want to change my accent. I don't want it anymore. I want to get rid of it. And I'm like, why? <laughs> the thing about it is having the tools is one thing, but getting rid of a part of who you are is another. So just really thinking about it now, I have so much to choose from in terms of tools. And then I can use my tools in whatever setting I choose, according to me, not letting something else dictate why I use this set of sounds versus this set of sounds amongst this set of group or this set of group. So it's, it's a lot that kind of um, education wise, I like to, to make sure clients know from the very beginning. Wow. Oh my goodness, it's a lot to take in. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. And I'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to kind of let people know because a lot of folks just, you know, accents can be something that can really, you know, can be triggering for some folks and for some, you know, can be very defensive. So, you know, just making sure that the objectivity is in place going forward, you kind of, you know, can settle some yeah. misconceptions, you know? Absolutely. So um, how is Adaptive Accent uh, different from other companies that offer similar services? Is there a specific um, formula that you follow? My company differs from other companies because I pair my accent modification uh, coaching 
in addition, I, I coach both executive communication in addition to accent modification. So when I say executive communication coaching, what I mean is I also am able to coach people in terms of their style or their delivery. Ooh. So when you think about communication, you've got the what we say, and then you've also got how we say what we say. I also coach how we say what we say. Hmm. So to kind of, let's see, kind of sum it up. If there's someone seeking, uh, for whatever reason, you know, I don't feel comfortable when I speak. I, I'm seeking more comfort. Okay. I start to take a look at what's going on internally, what's going on in terms of the setting you're speaking in. Does it change day to day? Do the people change day to day? Does what you're talking about change? So what I do is I offer from the very beginning, we've got accent modification services and we've got style and delivery coaching. So in other words, pronunciation for what most people consider accent modification I'm working on articulation or pronunciation, how you say the sounds in the language that you speak. And another thing a lot of people may not realize is that accents are not just foreign accents in terms of you're from somewhere other than the United States and you have been speaking a language other than English for all of your life up until you learn English. There are people who live in the United States who do speak English, but they have an accent because they may live in the South. I live in the South. I am from Georgia. If I speak a certain way, you can sometimes say, oh, you must be from. But if I'm able to switch it up because I'm using some different tools, then we could say, oh, I'm not really sure where you're from. So it's really about what, again, what you're after in terms of your personal goal. So that's how I differ from other companies. I I really focus on the not so much presentation skills or public speaking, but it's more about your communicative interaction with other people. So growing from the inside, but also it coming out and being shown on the outside. And then that's pretty much what we need, especially if you're like an executive or a leader that's leading a team. I think that's important. Very much so. We do have a lot of folks that have to speak quite frequently in front of others. And, you know, they just want to make sure they're up on their game in terms of I'm comfortable and I'm getting across the message that I want to get across, the intended message to my listeners. Absolutely. Wow. So um, as a, as a speech and language um, pathologist, you work with uh, people of all ages group, right? All age groups. Yes. So what has, mm-hmm. you, what has been your biggest challenge so far and how did you overcome it? Ooh, what has been my biggest challenge so far? Well, the work for me is not the challenge. Everything around the work <laughs> is what I'm not familiar with. As a speech pathologist, and an executive communications coach, accent modification specialist. Those are the things that I truly enjoy. And I I thrive off of that. And they are what, you know, what I feel is rewarding work. But everything past that in terms of how to orchestrate, (laughs) how to keep business measures in order, and, you know, having a certain standard, wanting to do it all yourself, Things like that, those are my biggest challenges. And sometimes because of that, it may sometimes take away from the time that I'd like to spend more so on, I'm going to continue perfecting this craft. So it's almost like an ongoing um, busyness for me, learning all of the things outside of being the speech pathologist, being the accent modification specialist, being the executive communications coach. So when I've got to be, you know, the person that keeps up with all of the documents, okay, <laughs> did we make sure we did this? Alexis is like, uh, I think so, yeah. Okay, where can we find it? You know, so those types of things for me have been the biggest challenge. Management of time outside of uh, client-facing work. Absolutely. So pretty much you're good in what you do, but when it's come to 
you know, the business <laughs> little thing. So let's put those aside. Somebody else can handle it. I'll do what I'm good at doing. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Oh, this is so funny. Um, so as an expert in communication, what do you think is the most important aspect that someone should work on for effective communication? For effective communication, I think people should really begin with diving deep internally, understanding what makes them comfortable, what makes them uncomfortable, really starting to search if this is where I am in terms of my baseline or this is where I am currently, where do I want to go from here? And again, there's it. I thrive on understanding the person and then guiding them, kind of facilitating their journey, not so much telling them what they should do, because anytime you get into telling people what they should and should not do, at some point they're going to run into an instance where it does not work. So we've got to always keep the client in mind in terms of what they say they want. I'm never the person to say, okay, this is what you should do. I simply give uh, instructions, give techniques, give strategies. And I actually make sure that people are doing these things once I give these instructions because we check in and I say, okay, have you been using these tools in real life? Are you actually integrating these things? So that for me is the biggest what you should do. Integrate the things that you say you want in terms of getting to your big picture goal. Because if we don't actually practice, if we learn them and then we're like, oh, that was really good. That was some good stuff. And then put it in the closet and then, oh, I got to speak. Oh my gosh, I got to remember what I, what I learned. <laughs> it can be very, very difficult. So the number one thing I always tell clients is make sure you're actually putting these things into practice because at some point they're going to become second nature. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with them the less it's going to feel like it's something new or something I don't typically do. It's more of, no, I know I have it in my back pocket if I need it, but I want to make sure I'm comfortable using it so it doesn't feel like the first time every time I pull these tools out. Absolutely. You know, one thing you already uh, kind of uh, covered a little bit, but I want to bring it back so people have a better mm -hmm. understanding of what it is. So can you uh, uh, tell us tell us about uh, accent modification? Uh, I know you because you are an accent modification specialist. Can you get into what does that really mean? What that entails, yes. Okay, so for example, if I have a client starting out, we go through what we call the, the initial assessment. The initial assessment is basically the client speaking into the computer or a microphone and what they do is they repeat 60 subset. This is a subset of 60 words. They speak the words in isolation. They speak the words in sentences. And then I have them speak in a paragraph. And so after everything has been recorded, now it's my job to do what is called transcription. So very similar to what I, what I have now, I have headphones where I listen to every single sound in every single word that they say. And if there's any difference between how it's typically spoken in the English language and the way that the client speaks it, then I make a mark of this is the sound that they're speaking in substitution of the sound that is here that I will be teaching. And so I go through and find out how many sound changes there are that are going to be made. And that actually helps me determine whether the person will go through a shorter workshop versus a longer one. So if someone has a very significant accent and it's, it's very difficult for them to uh, speak all of the sounds in the English language, they'll likely have the longer or the 12 week versus the six week. So once I go through the full assessment, go through the full transcription, I come back to the client, we have a consultation. I talk about the different sounds that we're going to cover. If there is a six, I'm sorry, if there's a 12 week workshop, the weeks, and typically I like to have the sessions back to back from week to week. And they're typically about an hour. And in, within each session, I teach the client through what we call uh, auditory discrimination. 
So I would do something like, I'd say a sound, cover it up. Okay. Oh, hold on for a second. I had a little look there. So I would say the sound without you being able to see me actually speak the sound. And then I'd ask the client, which, which sound did you hear? And so what that does is train the ear, because if you really think about it, if you don't hear a sound the right way, you can't produce it the same way. So once they hear it, now they understand, okay, this is how it sounds. And then I also teach by placement. So for example, if I'm teaching the sound, the tongue is right behind the teeth where what we call the alveolar ridge, and there's a puff of air that is released behind it. So so I, I kind of explain along with some structural outlines where the client can actually see you know, where the sound is placed in the mouth and also modeling. So they get to practice multiple times. So that goes on for within each session. Once the workshop gets to about the ninth session, 10, 11, and 12, the last few sessions, we then go to what we call common words and phrases. So where these sounds are now used, you know, just in random, regular conversation, but typical phrases like, what time is it? Or would you like to run to the store with me? Anything that's something, you know, that's something in their world is going to make sense personally and professionally that they may say a lot. So that way they're starting to kind of use these sounds without just me saying, okay, repeat this word with this sound this way, this many times. It's now kind of giving the client more independence because they're about to, in essence, graduate. And so from there, at the conclusion of the whole workshop, what the client receives is their initial recording versus the one that they concluded the workshop with. And it's up to them. I always tell them, I want you to listen to it because, because there is change because it takes time you know, a lot of these things are behavioral, how we speak, you know, and how we sound is because of when we learned it and we just continue to repeat. So that's why, again, the maintenance program after the sessions have concluded, after the full workshop is over, is so important because it's great to learn something while you're in it. But if you don't continue, it's just like anything else. If you don't use it, you lose it. So that is... That's the typical way of instruction for accent modification. Sometimes I have what I call a hybrid model because I have folks that are seeking to work on their accent. So really expand their phonetic repertoire. But in addition, they like to be coached in terms of their style and delivery. So I have a program that merges the two. Wow. It's so pretty much you spend a lot of time to really get to know that client and to know that how oh, yes. you're going to make that modification. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's why none of this is really, it's not even really a way that you can do something that's cookie cutter for folks looking to change their accent because you have folks, just in my last group, I had three folks that were from China, but they were from all different areas. So even within China, they may have a different, um, you know, I like to say sauce sometimes or a different dialect that changes just from, you know, a few miles down the road. It can be anything, even though you're staying in the same country, you may sound different. Same thing for, you know, here in Georgia. So that's why that initial assessment, that initial phonological assessment is so very important. That is really what truly is the customization because everyone is different. Yes, absolutely. So I know you're from the South in Georgia. Did you face any BS with your accent uh, at all? Did you all, did I? yeah, did you face like any problem because you have an accent? Oh, for myself. Yeah. Oh, for myself. Oh, very interesting question. Okay. Now, I was born in Philadelphia, moved to Atlanta when I was about six months, I believe, my parents told me. And from there, 
I stayed in Atlanta till about six years old. I remember starting second grade in Augusta, Georgia. When I lived in Atlanta, lived here, we lived in an area of Atlanta or maybe not an area of Atlanta, but I lived in Decatur, Georgia. It's not far from Atlanta. And when I grew up there, you know, I did have an accent. (laughs) But then when I moved to Augusta, everyone asked me, why do you talk like that? Why do you sound like that? And I'm thinking, what do I sound, what do I sound like? <laughs> because all I've ever heard is what I've heard from where I was from. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Versus when I go somewhere else, I'm now being reminded that I sound different. And so for me, I think that is where the awareness kind of kicked in. Like, huh. That's interesting. Do I sound different? Well, what do I sound like? And so my head just always thought through that going all the way through to high school. And then when I took that speech class, I think it all kind of came back together like, oh, I could study that. That That is interesting. So when I moved, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a purposeful thing that I'm, I'm going to change the way I talk now that I live here. I think because of the move, my speech started to change naturally because of my new environment. Not well, I never think of it that way, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was very um it was very much a culture shock. Where I moved from in Decatur, Georgia was predominantly black, and then where I moved to in Augusta was predominantly white. And so you could imagine there were some different thoughts running through my head as to, hmm, I don't know if I do sound different. And if I do, why do I do? <laughs> do I change it? Do I not? You know, so it, 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 it was always an interesting thing for me, always an interesting topic. Yes. Wow. So do you think that a change is needed with social relationship perceptions when it's come to different dialects and accent? So um, what measures can be taken to achieve it? Well, code switching is one thing. Code switching is for a client, what I teach, I'll say, okay, this is the way that you speak. I want you to be able to keep that. However, when you're in this setting, if this is how you would like to speak, you could have these tools to use them there. So code switching very, very much at the basis starts with awareness. So what I was talking about in terms of when I left Decatur and moved to Augusta, I didn't know how to code switch. I didn't even know what that was. My awareness was completely low. I'm seven years old. But at the same time, from your environment, you start to pick up different cues and you hear how sounds are produced. So some folks may purposely say, okay, this is how I'm going to learn it. This is how I'm going to talk. But if your awareness is not there, how could you? Now, the other thing about code switching, once you have the, the tools to code switch, it's really up to you when and where you use them and who you use them with. It's, it's really, in my opinion, that's, that's your choice. And for me, <laughs> you know, your life kind of dictates, I would say, what it is that you're really going to do in the moment. Because you start to, as you, as you mature and as you grow, you find yourself in a lot of different settings. And so just again, having the awareness and having the tools, just push go. Wow. So you started your company back in 2012, if I remember correctly, which has been a long yes. time. So yes. with so many years of entrepreneurship, you know, experience behind you, how do you cope with challenges you know you have uh, especially during the pandemic because it's like from 2012 things was moving along just oh, yeah. fine and then pandemic boom good morning america oh yeah so how did you deal with all that challenge <laughs> yes well the biggest change has really actually been a good change it's really everything that i do can be done from the computer and before the pandemic that wasn't my first choice but it, it is a choice and it actually is a very convenient choice 
because now out over the years, the clientele that I work with has grown significantly in terms of where they are located. And I think the pandemic just in general had a lot to do with that because instead of a lot of travel back and forth here, there, and everywhere, it's like, if, if it works for the client, first and foremost, if it works for them, then we'll, we'll go with virtual as the first choice. But if it's something that is, you know, it requires me to be there, then I'll be there. But it actually started to open my eyes in terms of, okay, because of the pandemic, there are other topics that I can teach people in terms of how to communicate over the computer just in general, because that, again, can affect the way that you come across or the way that you're perceived. So at the beginning, once the pandemic did hit, it was kind of like, uh, you know, they gotta, you have to work from the computer now. But after some time, it's just like you get into your groove and you just keep going. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So any word of advice for future women entrepreneurs? A word of advice is if it persists in your spirit, do it. I, I don't feel that, you know, you would have the thoughts about things or the the draw to research something or to look something up if it wasn't something that you know drove you and so for me that that kind of is what really pushed me when i when i graduated i said i want to work with accents i want to teach i want to be a professor i want to do something where i'm you know really actually teaching not so much just being a clinician but i actually i wanted to teach in some way and I started to think outside the box in terms of, well, how can I make it work for me? It may not be conventional. It may not be the, the typical path that everybody takes out of school. You go to school, you go to, you know, get your master's, you go here and you do this and you work in the same line of work or in the same position for 58,000 years. No, I'm not doing that. That doesn't fit me. And so I just continued the path and just kind of taking one step at a time, not saying, okay, it's got to be done and it's got to be done like this. Everything that I did in terms of where I am today was a learning step. It was a venture that I was just like, well, let me just keep going. Let me see what happens. Let me see how this works. Because, I mean, it's all it's all learning. You're going to learn from it if you don't end up where you want to be at the very start or halfway through, wherever, whatever it is. Just continue moving forward. It may not be the progress that you want all the time, but it is progress. As long as you just keep moving forward, I think that's a that's a great thing to keep in the forefront of your mind, not in the back. Absolutely. So business is yeah. like uh, an ups and downs, especially at the beginning of it. But oh, if yeah. you give up, <laughs> how would you know? You know, you got to keep on going. Exactly. I know you of all people, I'm sure you could tell folks that <laughs> because I mean, what you're doing is, is amazing. So yeah, just, you know, and always keeping the faith, thinking that you can, thinking positively, that's another huge thing because self-talk is huge. If it's negative, yeah, your outcome's going to be negative. <laughs> if it's positive, typically you'll see some of your progress start to turn into success and things that you actually set out to do when you first began. Absolutely. And also, I think another great thing will be surround yourself with positive people because negative people will just pull you down to the ground. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they certainly will. They certainly will. So you and that's one other thing is, you know, sometimes, you know, telling other people exactly what you want to do and where you're your, you know, your learnings are going and all of that may not be for them just yet. It may not be for someone else to know just exactly what you're doing because they may, without you even knowing it and not even being malicious, may thwart your plan or may swerve your plan into something that, well, that's not really what I wanted to do. So really keeping what your vision was from the outset, keep that in your field of vision. Absolutely. Thank you for the advice. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Anything else <laughs> oh, you'd like no. to share with us before I let you go today? 
No, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with me. I was honored when you asked and just really humbled at being able to, you know, tell people about adaptive accents, tell people what it is that I do and just sharing that accents are not deficient. They are simply different and hoping that just that small piece of education can break down some barriers within the world, not just within work communities and organizations, but just overall. Absolutely. So thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you so much, Alexis, for being here with us. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule and giving us some tips. No because problem. When I was reading about <laughs> your company, it was just like, really? That's interesting. I have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> a very I do too. Accent. <laughs> I do too, and flaunt it, flaunt it, definitely. I, that's what I always say. What a great conversation with Alexis. I have a strong accent, like you can tell. So I understand the importance of having someone like Alexis to help. Thank you, Alexis, for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Let me know your thoughts about this episode. And to learn more about Alexis and her company, Adaptive Accent, visit www.adaptiveaccent.com. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmel.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.